So the objectives we'll cover um, are identifying risk factors and screening tools for unhealthy alcohol use in older adults. We'll review treatment options and the evidence and consider integration of geriatric care principles um, with harm reduction. I'm gonna get started with a story of one of my patients that kind of illustrates the complexities of appropriately diagnosing unhealthy alcohol use in older adults. Um, she was a 94 year old female who came to my attention after having three falls in the last few months during transfers at her ALF. Um, according to her daughter, she had a history of firing her previous therapists um, due to personality differences, but uh, would like for her to mother to try home health again. So I agreed and in two weeks, she had once again fired her PT, but as it turns out, he had discovered her inebriated during one of her, their sessions um, and found that she had drank three glasses of wine that morning, um, something she never disclosed to me or her daughter. Um, and that is a very common presentation for some of our older adults. Uh, historically, older adults have not had high rates of drug and alcohol use. Um, however, the baby boomer generation came of age during a time when our culture was shifting attitudes towards alcohol use. Um, and many have not changed their drinking patterns as they've aged. Uh, the most recent numbers from the 2015 to 2017 NSDUH survey showed that 10.6% of older adults currently binge drink, um, and that's current past month binge drinking behavior and rates are increasing. Um, here are some numbers detailing the changes from 2005 to 2014, um, which is a steep increase in use in the general US population. But when you limit that data to just 65 and older, there was a 40% relative increase in past year AUD with an 84.6% increase in female participants specifically. But in primary care, we can um, cash this upstream. Um, 10 to 15% of all primary care patients meet criteria for problem drinking, which is defined as drinking at a level that results in or increases the likelihood of adverse uh, consequences. And why is this alarming for older adults? Um, the normal physiologic changes of aging increases their risk for adverse outcomes. Uh, so changes like decreased liver function, uh, total body water, as well as increased neuronal sensitivity to alcohol, all overall increase um, sensitivity and decreases tolerance. They are also more vulnerable to acquiring new or exacerbating existing medical conditions, such as hypertension, arrhythmias, hemorrhagic, stroke, uh, cirrhosis, uh, GI bleeds, and cancers. Um, they also uh, will have interactions with prescribed me medications, which older adults have tend to have more of. Um, Binge drinking in particular is uh, dangerous because it negatively affects comorbid conditions and causes unintentional injuries, which as we know is a major cause of death and disability in older adults. And because of these uh, well-demonstrated changes, the National Institute of Alcohol Abuse and Alcoholism, NIAAA, recommends lower maximum drinking limits for all adults 65 and older. Um, and note that these guidelines are for healthy adults not taking any medication. So the limit should be even lower for most of our patients. Um, the thing is the ma many of our patients and their providers aren't aware of these lower limits and that impedes the diagnosis of AUD even further. Um, a good rule of thumb from Dr. Jim Walsh at ARS is to recommend that as people enter older age to half the amount of alcohol that they drink. Um, and why is AUD in older adults uh, underdiagnosed? Um, impairments uh, that uh, are usually alert us to AUD um, don't surface as often if the person lives alone, is socially isolated, has given up drinking, um, is retired with no risk of losing a job or a career, has no family members to manifest conflicts with. Um, and so they can often go undetected for a long time. Um, AUD can also mimic other common diagnoses such as depression and cognitive impairment. Um, and because of poly polypharmacy and other comorbidities, the presenting issue is usually exacerbation of another medical issue or even delirium during periods of withdrawal due to the lower tolerance. All of these can act as red herrings and mask the underlying trigger of AUD. For a generation that lived through the war on drugs, 
uh, AUD is also highly stigmatized. Many older adults in their families believe that alcoholism is a moral weakness, and thus denial can be a, a big barrier to diagnosis. Um, this is reflected in the words that patients themselves use, um, such as addict, abuser, junkie, clean versus dirty, um, and we need to be very careful not to mirror this. Um, and lastly, providers just don't ask. Um, studies have shown that physicians are less likely to ask older adults about drinking, and much of the AUD field itself is focused uh, on younger populations. Uh, we often have a stereotype of what a person with AUD looks like or fear offending the patient and don't ask. So for example, like my patient um, in the beginning, um, older females generally drink less than their male counterparts, uh, but because of that, they're generally less likely to be screened or seek help, even though the demographic data show that um, there's significant increase in older females who binge drink or have a, um, AUD. Um, most women don't change their consumption after age 50, but those who do tend to increase dramatically. Um, so let's move on to screening and diagnosis. Um, some risk factors. These are associations drawn from a large demographic study conducted by Han et al. Um, based on the NSDUH. Um, and I wanted to highlight um, the associations with concurrent tobacco and cannabis use, which is um, well established, as well as um, these patients having fewer than two chronic diseases, which is a little bit counterintuitive um, and gets at the sick quarter hypothesis, meaning that there, there is an association between no or little alcohol consumption and health risks. Um, and that can be explained by former heavy drinkers who, that, who then quit consuming alcohol after experiencing a lot of medical issues. Um, but they continue to be at high risk for consequences despite their abstinence. Um, and this also indicates the importance of asking our older adults with a lot of comorbidities about past alcohol consumption habits. Uh, here's the um, uh, standard drink equivalents um, according to the NIAAA. And the most important data to elicit in screening is quantity of drinking. And it's important to note that a lot of these amounts don't reflect our usual um, serving sizes. Um, and as many of us have talked about, um, very little time in primary care. And so it's perfectly good to use a single question screen. Um, this is the modified NIDA quick screen. Uh, and this really gets at binge drinking behaviors. We're also very familiar with the audit C, which is well validated for a variety of settings and diverse populations, including older adults. Um, so it's three questions. Uh, we've also heard about CAGE, which screens well for dependence, but doesn't catch binge drinking behaviors, which is just as dangerous for older adults. So we don't tend to use the CAGE as often. Um, if you have a little bit more time, you can use the SMAS-G, which is um, specifically designed to identify drinking problems among older adults because they get at associations of drinking with loss, isolation, um, and uh, decreased appetite. And so those are also suggestions for questions um, to, to talk, talk to your patient about. Um, and these are the DS, some DSM-5 criteria um, where you diagnose AUD when somebody has uh, meets two of these criteria over six months. Um, and some, some consideration for oral adults, um, looking at uh, how much they are drinking, um, larger amounts over a longer period of time than intended. Um, oftentimes, if the patient has existing cognitive impairment, um, that really prevents adequate self-monitoring, um, as well as their cognition um, being affected by the alcohol itself more significantly than in younger adults. Um, and with older adults, they tend to have more entrenched habits, and that can impede them from uh, recognizing cravings um, or uh, rec recognizing behaviors as cravings or um, that alcohol is the, the root cause of many of their problems. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, a role obligations in older adulthood um, is, can be very different. Um, and so paying attention to obligations that are common to late life, such as caregiving for um, an ill spouse or family member. Um, uh, the criteria talking about um, decreased activities in older age um, that can exist regardless of substance abuse. And so some, sometimes that can muddy the waters. Um, 
and just knowing the the paradoxical um, appearance sometimes that older adults will have lower tolerance as they age, but that can still be uh, uh, um, still at high risk for AUD. And withdrawal symptoms just tend to be more subtle and protracted and can sometimes be harder to detect. Um, so in general, um, just higher sensitivity um, for screening our adults. Um, some notes on AUD and cognitive impairment. Uh, this is really common syndrome, a geriatric syndrome that presents to clinic. Um, so Wernicke's uh, encephalopathy, oftentimes this is underdiagnosed and, uh, um, and since treatment is really simple, um, you would wanna consider thiamine treatment even if one of the classic symptoms are missing um, because patients rarely present with a classic triad. Um, Korsakoff syndrome, uh, presenting with memory impairment, um, remembering that 80 to 90% of Wernicke cases actually progress to this uh, and can happen in any thiamine deficiency states um, such as malnutrition and malabsorption, which our older adults are more prone to developing. Um, and being more used to, to uh, thinking about alcohol-related dementia syndromes, which is now formally alcohol-induced major or minor neurocognitive disorders. Um, and this is a clinical diagnosis based on dementia directly related to alcohol use. Um, uh, but in this age group to keep in mind that it's often a mixed picture. So um, also considering vascular dementia, immune-related injuries, trauma, and metabolic dysfunction. So treatment. Um, so I'll be in, in the interest of time um, skipping uh, oh, uh, the detox um, piece of treatment um, as Dr. Ye will be talking next about, uh, about a little bit about that. Um, but in general, uh, for older adults, that is uh, recommended to be inpatient. Um, so first and foremost, uh, for our older adults, lower reserve means early identification and treatment is essential. So quickly evaluating for coexisting causes or mimickers and having a low threshold for looking at other substance use disorders um, and trying to identify the risk of withdrawal early and treating. So this is the detox page that I'm happy to talk about offline, um, but I will go ahead to talk about relapse prevention. Um, the thing to note here is that psychosocial interventions are just as effective in older adults as their younger counterparts. So really giving um, a good plug for AA and smart recovery. Um, and another tidbit from Dr. Walsh is to look for cohorting groups. Um, uh, patients of any age actually um, will do better and be more consistent if they're in a group that is like them. Um, IOPs are also just as effective. Um, unfortunately, Medicare only covers hospital-based rehab unless you are dual eligible, so it can be a barrier. Um, and we know that medication-assisted treatment um, also is associated with better results. And the thing to remember here is that first line is naltrexone, um, which can be used in mild liver impairment and sometimes even compensated cirrhosis. Um, but you want to be careful with those who need opiates for pain uh, management. You can also consider acamprosate, which is similar in effect, but less studied um, and is dosed more often as, uh, as well as being a bigger pill. Um, and disulfiram is just not recommended. Um, for the um, com combined trial, um, I thought there were some interesting takeaways that was the largest pharmacotherapy trial to date, um, where it showed that visits with uh, an MD were comparable to specialty treatment, um, especially when combined with naltrexone or placebo pills, which is to say two things. Uh, one, that the placebo effect is significant, and two, that monitoring and frequent follow-up with your patient um, in the end decreases drinking days. So really um, uh, keeping up with uh, um, the actual visits and that relationship with your patient is really significant. Um, for those who are cognitively impaired, unfortunately, I don't have any secret strategies for you, but a structured routine and removing access goes a long way to help with um, alcohol-related uh, complications. And lastly, um, always addressing the family structure. A lot of our older adults um, don't have a way to get alcohol themselves, and so addressing how they are accessing the alcohol. Um, and thinking about caring for the caregivers themselves, um, uh, especially when we start to have different goals in treatment, um, this can really complicate uh, 
complicate uh, treatment as some family will attach more values to complete sobriety, whereas the patient themselves may, may not uh, agree with that goal. Um, and so always checking in uh, with each person involved. Um, and there's actually all in non-family groups, which is basically AA for caregivers. Um, and now to uh, wrap things up, um, I'll be talking about integrating geriatric care principles and really treating AUD as any other chronic medical disease um, in management. Um, so uh, a lot of these tidbits are taken from Dr. Benjamin Hahn's uh, opinion piece in the International Dr uh, Journal of Drug Policy in 2019, where he makes a great case for managing um, or grace for in integrating geriatric care principles with harm reduction. Uh, so listen carefully for many of the overlapping principles in which um, the harm reduction approach um, uh, over, uh, overlaps with geriatrics care, such as humanism, pragmatism, individualism, autonomy, and incrementalism. Um, so right in the middle here, um, it, this is the fundamental approach of geriatrics, which is providing optimal care for older adults with multimorbidity uh, in the setting of competing risks. Thus, uh, a large part of the work is not to focus solely on disease-specific outcomes, which we're really used to thinking about, but also to integrate patient-centered and goal-oriented um, outcomes, such as maximizing functional status, maintaining independence, symptom management, and de-escalation of care. Um, geriatrics also emphasizes the importance of identifying and managing geriatric syndromes, such as falls, cognitive impairment, and frailty, which are independently associated with uh, uh, decreasing mortality risks and healthcare utilization if we're able to um, address those. And this is especially relevant in the elderly with uh, SUDs because problems with unhealthy use often accelerate onset of these conditions. And we tie that all together with shared decision making. Um, so unfortunately, despite its similar approaches, geriatrics medicine has not focused a lot on SUDs and vice versa. Addiction medicine has not focused on um, the older population, but um, as the two fields start to work more concurrently, I would envision the PCP and the patient-centered medical home to be on the forefront. Um, but first we have to shift our own framework for SUD treatment in our elders. Uh oh, <laughs> did we lose our slide? Okay. Um, so special thanks to Dr. Rubenstein, Dr. Hahn, and Dr. Walsh, um, who all contributed personally to this presentation. And these are my references. Thank you.